On June 18th, 2018, I attended a graveside service. A small group gathered to pray, sing, and remember together. But this was no ordinary funeral. The grave site was constructed in the middle of the lobby of the Minneapolis mayor's office. A tarp was laid down and dirt was piled up and a headstone was placed, all to commemorate the lives taken by Minneapolis police. A litany of names was read. Each name, a beloved child of God. Each name, a life cut short by state violence. Each name, a vivid reminder that the current system of policing only protects and serves some. So as the vigil continued on the third floor of City Hall, a group of around 100 people gathered outside to demand change. It was long past time that the city invest in real community solutions rather than just continuing to throw more and more money at the police department. At the same time, a small group of clergy folks went to deliver copies of a report called MPD 150 to each of the sitting city council members. That report is a history and a kind of citizen's performance review of the Minneapolis Police Department since its founding in 1867. As the vigil continued, a small trickle of the city council members came outside to join us to listen to the songs, the speeches, and the poetry that all spoke to a deep sense of human dignity that is not reflected in the current system of policing. So our event was called Beloved Community Means No Police. Friends, even as the rally's MC, I was like, oh, how is this going to land with folks? Such an idealistic sounding vision of no police. Now, at that point, I was not familiar with the strategies, tactics, and kind of general brilliance of abolitionists like Mariam Kaba and Ruth Wilson Gilmore. I was nervous and unsure, even though we had been so intentional to avoid language like abolition or even defunding. But this event was part of a six-week series of direct actions as part of the Minnesota Poor People's Campaign. And it was one of the lower attendance events because faith communities weren't ready to talk about policing. It was a part of the system that was just a bridge too far, especially for white moderate Christians who had up to that point been central to those actions. But as I listened to the damning history that was reported in MPD 150 and the prophetic imagination of the poetry and songs, those started to work their way into my spirit. I felt a deep sense of pain to understand and recognize how harmful policing has been since its inception and that I had been colluding with it in my own ignorance. But I also experienced profound hope listening to the poetry, speeches, and songs that all testified that another world is possible. So I was just a baby abolitionist at that point, but the commingled pain and hope of that rally set me on a new course. Now, it was a lower attended event, but there was momentum that carried into the fall as a small group of scrappy volunteer organizers set their sights on the Minneapolis budget process. They were focused on divesting some of the extraordinarily large police budget in order to intentionally invest in community-rooted services that would actually have better outcomes and reduce calls to the police for nonviolent incidents. These conversations were strategic and specific. 
They were identifying interest convergence across a variety of organizations and with allies and within the city government. I was getting to watch in real time the prophetic imagination of poetry take shape in the extremely practical. I am not kidding you when I say that their spreadsheets were like little works of art. <laughs> now, the logic, the underlying logic of abolition and defunding recognizes that decades of police reform efforts haven't worked. The history of policing in the United States is fundamentally shaped by a white supremacist ideology and the subordination of black, indigenous, and people of color. With white supremacy in the very DNA of the system, no amount of reform effort is going to transform the core. So fast forward two years to May 2020 when George Floyd was callously murdered by then Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. And the police greeted peaceful protests with continuously escalating tactics. And the city burned. Now just so you know, I live just a few blocks from where George Floyd was murdered. And a mile and a half from the police precinct that was burned down, among many other buildings. We would wake up in the mornings having to keep our windows closed because there was a smoky haze outside and ash covering the lawn. But at night, we took turns with our neighbors, neighbors we organized with on Discord. We took turns with our neighbors keeping an eye out for what was going on outside. Because friends, there were literally armed white supremacists driving around terrorizing our neighborhoods, taking pot shots, setting incendiary devices, and coming back and setting fires. We had to turn to one another because we could not turn to the police. That was a crucible moment for me as an abolitionist. It was no longer this like lofty ideal. It was an existential need. And I realized a gospel imperative. Because friends, we are called to love God and love others, all others. And not just in over-spiritualized ways, in material ways that seek to bring our behavior and our beliefs into alignment. Now, with the veil ripped back on policing, I couldn't turn away when I understand that this system maintains empire and opposes the gospel ways of love. So, as it was mentioned, I am Minister of Public Witness at New City Church in Minneapolis. We're a church plant in right, <laughs> right in the middle of all of that was going on, and our folks showed up. They showed up and they showed out. Every protest, every mutual aid drive, every kind of community care you can imagine, our people were boots on the ground. But it wasn't enough. We decided we really needed to turn our theological curiosity toward this idea of policing. So we had a sermon series and series of community um, interviews called, Did Jesus Police? And that series invited all of us to really start to think about how policing has colonized our thinking about violence and harm and has suppressed our creativity and imagination for more transformative alternatives, alternatives that would be better aligned with the gospel. Now, I've said that, you know, it's been a journey. I've learned a lot about abolition in the last few years. Some of, some, I've learned a lot from the organizers, like Reclaim the Block. I've, or, I've learned a lot from abolitionists like Miriam Kaba, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, and Angela Davis. But my most important teacher has been my son. My son is 19, and he is autistic. 
And let's just say, over the years, he's had multiple incidents. Um, incidents in which he came across like a violent aggressor. I still have a visceral reaction when I see the number for the high school come up on my phone because I got so many phone calls from school. And friends, I did not know. I didn't know what we'd done wrong, what we should be doing, what was going to happen next. But then I paused and I started asking a different question. What is his unmet need? Because he was melting down, for sure. He was acting out, definitely. But he wasn't malicious or seeking to do harm. His needs weren't being met. His needs for care, for belonging, for understanding. He needed compassion, not punishment. And frankly, the worse, like the more punitive the response was, the worse his behavior got. So I looked at my kid, and I knew three things for sure. He is beloved by me and by God. He is so much more than his worst behavior. And loving him meant meeting him where he was at, but not letting him stay there. He is loved, he is forgiven, and his behavior can be transformed through compassionate accountability. So I look at him and I wonder if this is true for him. I mean, obviously he's special because he's mine, right? <laughs> but if it's true for him, what if it's true for all the other people we so, as society, so easily label criminal and send away. Now, I wish I could tell you exactly what compassion and accountability looks like in all cases. I would write a book. I cannot. So I can tell you, though, it doesn't look like the current system of policing and prisons. Now, it's uh, been quite a journey. It, I have been tested a little bit, um, including I got a call last spring from a colleague who opened the conversation by saying he was likely going to leave a small group we'd both been part of for over a year because of my anti-police stance. Now, just for some context, he is a local pastor and serves as the chaplain for both the police department in his city and the state patrol in his area. He's deeply connected with the law enforcement community. I didn't reply right away. He continued on to say that he was concerned because he didn't think I saw police as children of God. Okay, I sputtered a little bit <laughs> and then was able to say, it is actually precisely because I see police as beloved that I want to abolish the system of policing. Because you cannot participate in a harmful system and be exempt from harm. It may not be the same harm. It may not be the same physical harm as those targeted by the system, but there is a moral injury sustained for those who participate in a system that regularly dehumanizes and degrades other people. So that's not the last hard conversation I'm gonna have. I may have some today, who knows, we'll see. Um, but I, I am committed to following this through. Now, when that group gathered around the makeshift grave in the mayor's office, none of us could have predicted how quickly the conversation would change in the next couple of years. The murder of George Floyd catalyzed a much broader conversation and movement. And that scrappy group of volunteer organizers, they've actually become a funded organization that has been continuing to work on policy change at the city level that would create long-term change. They worked with a coalition of organizers to bring forth a ballot initiative in last fall's um, election 
that would have created a Department of Public Safety with much more robust non-police services that would actually reduce harm and violence. Um, now, that didn't pass. We got 43% of the vote, though. That was pretty good for the first time out. Um, the conversation is not over, though. It is far from over. And I think that there are more and more people committed to the collective work of both imagining and building new resources and systems. There is, in fact, an organization that has emerged in the last year or so called REP, Relationships Evolving Possibilities. And one of the things that they've done is building off of those community safety practices with Discord that we practiced during the uprising, they've actually codified that into a, a secured hotline, actually, that community members can call and teams of trained folks will come out and respond to things like noise complaints, neighbor complaints, conflict de-escalation, de and um, mental health crises. And it's not alone in that community-rooted solution. In fact, again, in Minneapolis in the late 1960s and early 70s, the American Indian Movement um, created AIM Patrol in response to police brutality that was being um, focused on Native American folks in the community. So not only were they patrolling the neighborhood to keep an eye out for violence against their folks by the police, but also intra-community intra -community violence. And so they were patrolling the community, doing conflict de-escalation, keeping an eye out, all without the, the policing system as part of their, their um, practice. So there are no easy answers to transforming a centuries-old system. But I believe if we truly believe in the inherent belovedness of all people, we're all invited, we're all called to this hard work of reimagining and building new ways that build health rather than more harm. Because friends, as Christians, aren't we called to join God in co-creating life-affirming ways rather than death-dealing systems? Aren't we called to build beloved community? And that means safer communities. Aren't we called to love our neighbors? May it be so. Thank you.